In this problem, we have a permanent magnet DC motor with a gear drive at the output shaft. So we want to synthesize the bond graph for this system. It is a mixed system because we have on one side an electric circuit, on the other side a mechanical rotation system. And they're coupled here at this element here represented by capital M. This element is the idealization of the electromechanical energy conversion. We can use our bond graph guidelines for electric circuits to synthesize the bond graph of this part of our system and those for mechanical rotation to synthesize for this part of our system and then couple those bond graph fragments through the gyrator that represents the idealization of the energy conversion from electrical energy to mechanical rotation. So we'll begin by treating the electrical side where we have one, two, three, four distinct voltages. This represents a generic voltage source. So we'll establish four distinct voltages for each of those. So we'll have here one, two, three, and four. Now, we can treat this as our explicit ground this will be a generic voltage source. We have an inductor, a resistor, and one side of our gyrator, which represents the energy conversion from electrical to mechanical. So we'll insert our one ports and our two ports. We'll begin first by recognizing that we're gonna treat this as our explicit ground. So zero volts here. Then we have between the bottom and left zero junctions, we're going to insert off of one junction our effort source to represent our generic voltage source. That generic voltage source supplies a voltage En. Now between the left and middle zero junctions off of one junction, we're going to insert our inductor, which is an I element. Between the next pair of one junction, zero junctions, excuse me, we have a resistor. And now between the last pair, we have one side of our, what's referred to as an ideal motor. That's the gyrator representing the energy conversion from electrical energy to mechanical energy. There is a voltage drop across the motor due to this energy conversion. That's EM referred to also as the electromotive force. Now, on the other side, we have mechanical rotation. And instead of identifying distinct voltages and establishing zero junctions, we must identify distinct angular velocities and establish one junctions. We have a distinct angular velocity here and here. And though this may look like a shaft, it's only elongated or exaggerated here to identify the distinct torques and angular velocities at these points. This angular velocity in actuality is the same as this one, but there is a torque difference. There's a torque coming out of the motor, and then there's some torque used to spin the rotational, en the rotational inertia of the rotor of the motor. So this represents the rotational inertia of the rotor this the inductance of that rotor and this the resistance of that rotor. 
similarly, this is just an exaggerated shaft. It's, there's really no shaft here. We can think of this as being short. There's no compliance. There is a torque and angular velocity labeled there. This torque is distinct from that, but these two torques, these two angular velocities must be the same. So we have a distinct angular velocity here and a distinct angular velocity at the output shaft. Here at this angular velocity, we have a rotational inertia, and at this angular velocity, we have a bearing. Hence, we're going to establish two one junctions to represent those two distinct angular velocities. I'll have a one junction here and a one junction here. Now, off the first one junction, we have a rotational inertia. So we'll establish an I element to represent the rotational inertia of the rotor of the motor. At the second one junction, we have a bearing. So we'll establish an R element with the bearing constant beta. Now, all that's left is to insert remaining one ports and two ports. Well, the only two port is the gear pair Right here, we have a spur gear pair with a gear ratio of N1 to N2. There are no other elements to account for because these shafts are actually short and rigid. There's no compliance there. Hence, all that's left to do is insert a transformer between these two one junctions. That transformer represents the spur gear pair that connects the output shaft of the motor to the output shaft at the bearing. We can assign power directions. If we assign them in this fashion, then we have a simplification that arises. That simplification results from the fact that there is a one junction with only two bonds. Hence, we can connect the R element representing the bearing directly off of the transformer representing the gear pair. Other simplifications that arise occur through our electric circuit part of the motor. If we treat the zero junction at the bottom as our ground, then we can eliminate ground and anything immediately attached. If we do so and choose our power directions in the following fashion, then we would have further simplifications due to the fact that we have junctions with only two bonds attached, one in and the other out. Hence, we're going to see that our effort source can be directly attached to this one junction, this one junction directly attached to that one junction, and this one junction directly attached to that gyrator. Recall that when you have adjacent junctions of the same type, they're in actuality the same junction. And if we look at this problem, we have a voltage source, an inductor, a resistor, and one side of our ideal motor connected in series, meaning they share a common current. So by inspection, we could have taken these elements and connected them off of one junction. If we redraw our simplified bond graph in the next page, we would have then an effort source connected off of one junction with an inductor. A resistor and one side of the gyrator 
which represents the energy conversion from electrical to mechanical. The gyrator modulus here would be the motor constant. On the other side, we would have our rotational inertia, which is also an I element. Going through a transformer, which is our spur gear pair, with a gear ratio of N1 over N2 to our bearing, which has a bearing constant of beta. Looking at this, we have the inductance, the resistance of the rotor on one side and the actual rotational inertia of the rotor on the other side. The rotor is physical. It has electrical properties and mechanical properties. It's rotating, so it has rotational inertia, and it's made of perhaps a copper winding, which would give, have inductance and resistance. So we have the voltage source in series with the inductance and resistance of the rotor. That is being converted in from electrical energy to mechanical. On the other side, we're accounting for the rotational inertia of the rotor. And then we have the gear pair, which is outputting through the output shaft, rotating in a bearing. There's our simplified bond graph.